important topic which kind of hurts everybody from institution to businesses how do we deal with barriers to trade and uh, what we plan to discuss today is that whether you know there has been a liberalization of trade and what is the nature of this liberalization are we moving away from tariff related barriers to more non tariff related barriers are we moving away for from uh, fdi restrictions to more regulatory restrictions and are these restrictions imposed on the grounds of security innovation green technologies etc uh, with me we have a very distinguished uh, panel uh, from uh, government to um, from policy makers uh, to uh, uh, to actually academicians and industry practitioners um, and what we tend to focus our discussion today is on uh, three major aspects one is that you know how what is happening in the um, trade agreements front what is happening in the wto what is happening in the ftas you know what are the specific areas how government are negotiating trade agreements what are the specific areas which are concerns how do we negotiate barriers how we lead to market integration and how businesses can actually navigate through these agreements and benefit from it i would not go into detail introduction of the speakers but um, and i would start from my left uh, 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 with the introduction and you have a booklet which gives you the details of the speakers in it you know dr job perry lehman is actually the emeritus professor of uh, international political economy in imd in lausanne switzerland he is more known for the evian group where he writes uh, very frequently on trade issues uh, wto ftas um, next to him is his majesty dr orlan chaiprawat uh, who is the economic advisor to the prime minister of thailand and he also is the president of thai uh, trade representative and he was the former deputy prime minister so if you want a policy maker with so many fta's in the asean and thailand so actively engaged in that who better than to have you sir to discuss it we have mr david short with us who is the senior counsel trade and, uh, and international affairs in fedex express usa he has a legal background and he can give us an insight into how businesses would be um, looking into trade facilitation issues so uh, just to give you a brief background of how we take the session forward um, we would be giving each speaker around 10 minutes to talk on the subject and then we would be moving out for the discussion among <coughs> the speakers and then open it for a floor interaction now uh, professor lehman to begin with you i wanted to understand from you you know what is the big issue today how is the wto doing how, what are your views on the trade agreements and do you think they would actually lead to reduction of barriers or are they complicating the matters much more thank you very much and uh, good morning everybody I, i what i'm going to start off doing is give us a very broad historical brush of of trade the history of trade in terms in, as a means of understanding the significance of what is happening now we are living in an absolutely amazing moment uh when looked at from that perspective uh trade has been an absolutely critical dynamic in the history of the eurasian continent over millenniums uh you had the silk road you had the spice route and it's really the whole history in a way of the world as it was perceived at the time i eurasian continent can be written in terms of trade the cross border flows of goods services people science art knowledge etc there's a new book that's out on um the silk road which says that in fact it was much more significant in terms of the transfer of knowledge than the transfer of goods so it was a unifying force uh, it was the early stages of globalization one of my favorite quotations on trade is by a tunisian 14th century historiographer called ibn khaldun who said through foreign trade people satisfaction merchants profits and countries wealth are all increased and that encapsulates absolutely magnificently what trade is about and as we progress through the 
history. We note in the early 15th century the rise of the Chinese seaborne empire, uh, particularly the role, critical role played by Admiral Zheng He, who undertook a number of voyages uh, around the world. If you'd been hanging around the world in about 1430, and you had been asked which country is got, going to dominate the globe in terms of trade and economic development and so on and so forth, it, without, without any hesitation, you would have said China. Uh, Zheng He was very advanced in terms of maritime technology, in terms of uh, shipbuilding, and so on. And then, absolutely amazingly, uh, in one of these decisions of history, the Ming Emperor Huan De took the decision to cease these voyages. Uh, ships were abandoned, destroyed, and China looked inward uh, and has continued to do so for about 500 years. I'll come back to that. And in the meantime, about half a century later, you got the rise of the Portuguese Seaborne Empire, followed by the Spaniards and the Dutch the British, etc., and of course the conquest of the New World. And that completely changed the paradigm. So from that moment on, in other words, if you look at history over a long period of time until about the late 15th, 16th, you had a lot of trading powers that were gaining, uh, losing, gaining, losing, etc., etc., the transfer. With the rise of the, these seaborne empires, uh, ir irretrievably, irreversibly, the West came to dominate global trade. And this was reinforced, of course, with the 19th century, uh, 18th, 19th century uh, global, uh, sorry, industrial revolution. So, so what we are witnessing now, as of about two or three years ago, is the reversal of a half millennium of history, in which the West no longer dominates, i.e. Europe or its colonial uh, offshoots. Now, the problem is that with this rise in the Western seaborne empires, their control of trade, and of course, has involved a, uh, a lot of uh, cross-border transfers, including of, of slavery. Uh, there was also trade wars, the Opium War in China. There was trade exploitation in Latin America, and so on and so forth. Uh, by the end of World War II, when the new global order was coming about, uh, trade was not seen in terms of what uh, Ibn Khaldun described but more in terms of the very influential Argentine economist called Raul Prebisch. And Raul Prebisch developed what was called the Dependencia Theory, whereby he said any country from what he called the periphery who engages in trade or investments with a country from the metropolis automatically falls in a dependency trap, and this is a sort of neo-colonial situation. And this perspective was by and large accepted in all what we would call at the time the third world countries. So India, Indonesia, Brazil, Argentine, Da 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 da. In fact, I see a Brazilian looking at me. The former President Cardoso, when he was a professor, wrote lots of books on dependencia theory. Fortunately, when he became president, he ignored his books <laughs> and proceeded to open up uh, the country. Um, and we see this, this as a general pattern. So, for example, China's perception was that it had been exploited by trade, beginning with the opium trade, uh, when Mao Zedong uh, came to liberate China. Uh, one of the things that was done, of course, was to isolate China from global business, from uh, trade and investments, uh, get rid of companies which had seen uh, as, as being. And, and this maintained, I remember once in 1981, I was in, in Delhi, and I was speaking to a senior civil servant about uh, uh, investment, trade, and so on, and multinational companies. And all of a sudden he looked at me and he said, remember, we were colonized by a multinational company, which of course was true, the East India Company. So there was a sort of lot of, in other words, the idea of even Khaldun, trade is beautiful, came to trade is very dangerous, you'll get caught in a trap, and you'll be uh, exploited. Um, and this changed abruptly in 1979. In 1979, in the words of a leading Chinese economic reformer, Zheng Bijian, he says the most important strategic decision Beijing took in 1979 was to embrace globalization rather than reject it. So you have a change in policy completely, and in fact, this embrace of globalization by China is what is writing the late, 19th, late 20th and early 21st century. Another writer on China, Jonathan Fenby, uh, in a new book, wrote, uh, in 1949, Mao changed China. In 1979, Hu Xiaoping changed the world. And, and I don't think that this is too much of an exaggeration. At the table that I was at yesterday, 
we were discussing, you know, what would be the situation of the emerging economies without China. China has been really the locomotive, the ubiquitous uh, global uh, power. So what we've seen is a global market revolution in the course of the last couple of decades. Um, I'm emeritus, therefore I'm old. And I remember many things like the Vietnam War. The Vietnam War was fought on the basis of what was called the domino theory, that if Vietnam fell to communism, well, so would Thailand, so would Malaysia, so would Indonesia, Switzerland. And so you had to stop it, you know, <laughs> there. And what we've seen in the course of the last uh, 10, 15, 20 years is the reverse domino theory, including Vietnam. Uh, so Vietnam has now abandoned Marxism and Leninism for what's called market Leninism. So you still have the Communist Party, but it's sort of market-oriented, the trading power, and so on and so forth. Myanmar is the most recent recruit uh, into the system. So it's pretty much of a... Uh, a global phenomenon. So that's what's one thing that's new. The other thing that's very new is what we're seeing is the end of what I call the hub and spokes paradigm of world trade. In other words, that for most of the post-war period, what you had was the OECD countries were the hub, and the other parts of the world were the spokes. So you traded between whatever trade there was between Indonesia and Europe was between Indonesia and Europe, not Indonesia and Brazil, uh, not even within these regions. So this hub and spoke system, and most multinationals in Europe or in America organize on that basis. I live in Switzerland near Nestle. The center is Vivey, that's the hub, and you have a vice president for the Americas, vice president for Asia, vice president for the da 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 and they all report into Vivey, although that's beginning to change. But this pattern, this particular paradigm is changing right now. We're seeing the role of the rise of South-South trade uh, and uh, investment. The problem is, and this I come back to the issues we were talking about yesterday with Patricia Hewitt and others about trade policy, is that trade has changed in exponential manner, trade policy linear at best. You see the point I'm making? In other words, new markets, new technologies, uh, the supply chain, which is really dramatically changing trade, but policy is not able to keep up with this, so you have a huge uh, governance gap. You also have a considerable amount of resistance uh, from the north uh, to the rise of the south. And, and this, I'm just throwing out like this, I'll be able to defend uh, this position. I've witnessed it. Um, I think Cancun, to a considerable extent, collapsed in 2003, was in a way a sort of battle between north and south, uh, and that uh, the north decided uh, to call it quits. But the point is that I want to also stress in my last 10 minutes, uh, <laughs> the last few minutes, is that I, I think before we get carried away by this euphoria of you know, the South has risen, is that there really is a considerable amount of disarray uh, in the South. Um, there are many, many obstacles to intra- and inter-regional South-South trade. Uh, one is, uh, I mean, it, again, it would depend on the regions. East Asia is doing fine. South Asia, not so good. Uh, and, and this is illustrated by the figures in inter-regional trade, the barriers and, and all the rest of it. Uh, South America, Latin America, not good. Uh, and Mercosur is not really functioning. Uh, it's, it's funny, when, when I go to world trade meetings, uh, the Brazilians are complaining about the North. When I go to Latin America, the Argentines are complaining about the Brazilians. <laughs> and the Bangladeshis complain about the Indians, and so on and so forth. So uh, this problem. Africa is, uh, is, is pretty bad, uh, very little intra-regional trade, very lot of barriers on infrastructure and so on. So now there's, you know, Africa is a new frontier, that, that, that you, you have to say, uh, but it's not going to be, the markets are too small. There's some positive developments taking place in uh, East Africa, uh, with East Africa, I forget what it's called, um, region, whatever, with Tanzania, Uganda, uh, Kenya and so on and so forth. And the Arab world, it's, 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 it's pathetic. I mean, as I constantly say when I go there, people talk about the region. There is no region. This means, among other things, that there's no, not only is there no cross-border trade between Arab countries, but there's very little infrastructure. Taking a, a plane from, uh, say, uh, Marrakesh to Cairo uh, very often involves having to go via Frankfurt. Uh, so, so and, and these barriers are very, very, very strong. I don't think that they should be uh, underestimated. Um, this is partly because of lack of information, lack of networks, lack of infrastructure, and lack of trust. 
So I, I think the idea that, that you know the trust deficit is between north and south, it's also within uh, the south. Now, on your question of PTAs, I worry, I think the TTIP is a very bad idea. I think it's going to distort trade. I think it's also going to detract from the, I mean, Geneva is becoming a ghost town. Uh, there's, everybody's going away, uh, so it's not going to get the attention. It's, it's gone, I'm prepared to make any kind of wager that the Doha round will not be concluded in my lifetime. Of course, that's not very long, but still, I won't be there to pay the wager if it's after my uh, <laughs> lifetime. Um, I think that what we do need is regional trade agreements within the South. Uh, in other words, to try and create space, make it much more attractive, uh, to create economies of scale, uh, and so on. And I think regional trade agreements can have an extremely important role in terms of peacemaking, even if not of trade making. So, you know, if you could get an FTA between Japan, Korea, and China, I mean, I, 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 yeah, it was fantastic. I think that's not going to happen in my lifetime either. Uh, but it would certainly, I think, diminish the tensions that there are over the Yaoyutai uh, Islands uh, and, and so on. Uh, so, I think there's a lot that can be done in terms of building up South-South connections in a sort of positive, constructive fashion. Regional trade agreements, I'm not in favor of the sort of bilateral mm -hmm. trade agreement, but regional trade agreements yet. But I would also uh, remind you of the comment that Mike Moore, the Director General of the WTO, made after Seattle in 1999 was his fear that the WTO would become the League of Nations of the world economy of the 21st century. That was in 1999. I think when you look at Geneva today, it looks indeed as if his uh, prophecy is coming true. So the world and the South need point was made earlier on, a robust, rules-based, multilateral trade regime. And to that end, there's an absolute imperative uh, and that there should be an entente in the South and leadership. And I'll perhaps come back to that in the discussions. But this is one of the things that we found extremely frustrating is that, you know, the South arrived, but it doesn't say anything. Thank you, Professor Lehman. And that kind of naturally fits into what Dr. Chai Pravat uh, would be speaking on. Uh, ASEAN is engaged in a lot of trade agreements and Thailand as a member of ASEAN is not only engaged in integration within the ASEAN, you have, a, you have already an integrated goods market, you are going in for the uh, integrating a lot of logistics and other services by uh, 2015. And if we take Professor Lehman's dream forward, they, you are, will be actively participating in the RCEP and you would be preparing for that, I believe. Uh, we would like to hear from you. Thank you. Professor Lehman has uh, sketched the, I just want to add a little bit uh, to certain part that is related to ASEAN. And, uh, and I certainly agree with his conclusion that uh, East Asia economic integration and uh, cooperation is fine, and he uh, advocated the uh, regional uh, cooperation and integration, uh, particularly South-South uh, arrangement. Um, that's back in 1850 when uh, Sir John Bowring uh, was Governor General of Hong Kong, and he sort of Force FTA on most of the uh, Asian countries, uh, including Thailand, uh, at that time was called Sire. So uh, FTA for us is not the first exercise. We have gone through FTA at least twice before, uh, during the Portuguese uh, influence time, and also during the uh, Sir John Barring uh, British uh, Empire. Organization period, FTA is imposed on a country like Thailand. And then the, after the war, after the Second World War, all the ASEAN countries uh, were in need of reconstruction and ready the uh, foreign direct investments uh, came from the West uh, and then sort of uh, made us all uh, subscribe to the concept of free trade uh, agreement as a means to export our products, labor intensive products, which were invested by the Western companies. 
then came the China story that you, uh, you said in 1979. And a little bit over 10 years ago, when the uh, uh, ASEAN countries decided that uh, we started ASEAN as a political and security arrangement uh, in the light of the Cold War, but now that security and political requirement was no longer there. So we decided to uh, do the experiment on what I would call, I would not call FTA, uh, but rather call a custom union agreement uh, first, just reducing all the tariff rates uh, to zero, and uh, at the same time protecting some of the sensitive industries in the cherished by member countries in their own economies. And then gradually we evolved into, uh, you might call it, uh, it can be partnership arrangement in the way that not only uh, international trade and custom duty rates have been taken in consideration, but also uh, some harmonization of certain rules and regulation that uh, would be uh, supportive to international trade and uh, cross-border investments and movements of uh, skilled labor force. Here we have harmonization of key uh, professions like medicine, engineering, accounting, and so on. So that evolved gradually into eventually uh, we decided to embark upon the uh, economic uh, community concept. Pretty much, pretty much, but not the same as the uh, European Union. But it's, it's something that uh, ASEAN, AAC, ASEAN economic community, which is supposed to be enforced within two and a half years, by the end of uh, 1950 have the realization of what we call ASEAN economic community. Ah, 2015, uh, three, three years ago. Um, then, um, what lesson can we learn from this intra-regional exercise? Uh, from trade union to economic partnership and to uh, economic we have learned along the way that uh, uh, liberalization of trade in itself is not enough to foster the uh, economic uh, partnership and integration. We need to do uh, in a dynamic concept, uh, environment, uh, not only trade but also investments and uh, labor force uh, management uh, across as a result, we also concurrently enter into some limited tariff uh, reduction program with early harvest provisions with the uh, big uh, country, China. And we also uh, uh, conclude the uh, economic uh, partnership uh, program with uh, Japan. That's between Thailand and China, uh, and Thailand and Japan. Now, come to the uh, Thai-India FTA, which uh, I would say typical uh, WTO type of FTA arrangement uh, with all the issues that practice in the uh, WTO concept. Not similar to the uh, economic partnership arrangement that we have uh, with China and with Japan. So. Uh, that being the case, uh, we have run into a lot of uh, problems, uh, as you would suspect, that uh, in uh, very diverse and different sized countries like India and China, a lot of uh, industries uh, to take care of and a lot of uh, interest groups to take care of. So uh, many uh, things have been delayed for the final conclusion. Our two prime ministers would like to get it done 
as soon as possible. And of course, as a, as a chief negotiator for Thai EU FTA, which is, I look at the detail agenda, typical WTO style FTA issues, which was launched last week in Brussels uh, by uh, Prime Minister and the uh, uh, Chief Commissioner of the EU. We would have to figure out ways and means of proceeding both the Thai India FTA and the uh, Thai EU FTA uh, negotiations. Uh, since I'm given a job to do it, I am thinking in my mind, and here I would welcome uh, suggestions from other experts here, whether or not I should be sticking to the WTO FTA type of negotiations, or should I be uh, deviating a little bit more into the sort of economic partnership uh, negotiations that we did with uh, Japan, uh, taking into consideration uh, more of the uh, interests of the various groups, uh, various stakeholders, not just uh, for free trade for its own sake, but also for overall uh, economic development so that it would become what the people from civil society now call as a, as a free and fair trade agreement. And that's, I just want to stop there. Thank you. Uh, before we move on into the discussions of your question, I would like to ask David about, as a practitioner, how do you look into these trade agreements? Do you really find them very useful? What are the trade facilitation issues? What kind of barriers do you face? Well, thank you, and good morning, everyone. I'm really delighted to, to be here with you. Uh, at FedEx, um, we can connect 95% of global GDP within 72 hours. So our businesses trade, and anything that any conference, any event that has the word trade in it, we're there. And uh, and, <laughs> and 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 just picking up on that introduction, one one of the key issues that we face in almost every country of the world is trade facilitation. So I'd like to take the next few minutes to talk a little bit about that. And and actually, my my comments in preparing my comments this morning, what really served as the spark was what I think is an incredibly important report that was issued about six weeks ago at Davos. It was issued by the World Economic Forum in cooperation with Bain and Company, which of course is here at this event, and also the World Bank. So the three of them cooperated, but it was a World Economic Forum report. And, and just in, in a sentence, what this report concluded was, if, if we were able to magically get rid of all the tariffs that remain in the world, right, which has been the focus of so much of trade negotiations, if we could just with, with the wave of a wand, get rid of all the tariffs that remain in the world, that would increase global GDP by less than 1%. Okay, it would be positive, it would be growth, but less than 1%. On the other hand, if we could get rid of the barriers to trade facilitation, global GDP would increase by 5%, okay, five times as much as getting rid of the tariffs. So that's why we at FedEx, and I think many of our customers who are the ones doing the, the business, feel like trade facilitation is, is really where the focus needs to be. Just before launching into it, you, you may be wondering, because I was wondering, how is that possible? You know, the world, the trade world is so focused on tariffs. How is it possible that this trade facilitation thing on the margins could yield such, such a huge payback? And as this World Economic Forum study showed, the answer is pretty simple. It's that when you have tariffs, that is shifting resources, okay? So if one country has a tariff that protects a certain industry, it may get the investment versus another country that, that might be more economically optimal for the investment. But really, all the, the tariffs are doing is shifting resources, whereas when you get rid of barriers to trade, you're actually avoiding the waste of resources. You're not having goods held up at the seaport for days and weeks and causing companies to have huge inventory costs. You're not um, requiring governments and private sector to hire people to uh, process useless paperwork. You're reducing cost, you're reducing waste, and thereby generating this, this really incredible potential for GDP growth. 
why is trade facilitation really more important now than ever before in the history of trade? And I'd like to pick up on, on uh, a little bit on a theme that uh, Professor Lehman touched on in his remarks. He, he talked uh, towards the end of his remarks about, about the hub and spoke being supplanted by maybe south-south trade and all sorts of different patterns of trade. And, and we agree with that to a point. But what we're seeing now is, is the trade is really based on value chains. It's not the classic trade where, let's say, France sells their really great Bordeaux wine to America, and America sells coal or something back. It's not the exchange of commodities. It's not even the exchange of finished products. It's about countries all <coughs> over the world contributing wh whatever they have as a comparative advantage to the value chain. Here's a quick example. I, I suspect everybody in this room has a cell phone, a smartphone, right? I'd be really surprised in 2013. We got people here, I think, from 30 countries, but regardless of, of the diversity, everybody carries a cell phone. Well, one of the key building blocks of every cell phone is the rare earth minerals. You would not have a cell phone without rare earths. The rare earths may come from someplace like the Democratic Republic of Congo or Kyrgyzstan or, 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 or one of several other countries. So they're mined in, let's say, the, the Democratic Republic of Congo. They've got to be moved from the DRC to Malaysia, which happens to have uh, great expertise at making these silicon chips so that the, the Malaysians will add their comparative advantage. They'll take the raw material from the DRC. They'll make them into chips. But, but that's all the Malaysians do. They're really great at making chips as e more efficiently than anyone in the world. But that's all they, they do in this particular value chain. Then those chips get to be moved to China. And the Chinese have expertise at making them into sub-assemblies. Meanwhile, the battery for your cell phone may have been made in Singapore. I know that's where the battery in my phone, which happens to be a BlackBerry, is, is made in Singapore. And then the Wi-Fi card comes probably from the, the South Korea, the Republic of Korea. All of that then may get sent somewhere like Mexico, which is where most Blackberries happen to receive final assembly. They put together all these components that have come in from a variety of countries and then export from Mexico to America to India to Europe, wherever the, the final consumer is. So, so all of that to say, my point is trade today is not just about the sale of that Finnish cell phone from Mexico to, to the UK or Mexico to India. It's about the whole value chain that was necessary to produce it. In involving product crossing borders many, many times. And every time a border has to be crossed, there is cost. The, the, the worse the trade facilitation of a country, the higher that cost and the less competitive the product. And conversely, the, the quicker the trade facilitation, the quicker and easier and cheaper it is to cross a border, the more competitive the product that is the result of that value chain. Trade facilitation um, also attracts investment and high wage jobs to a country. Let me give you this example. One of our customers at FedEx is one of the world's leading producers of medical devices, really advanced uh, devices for all sorts of, of medical, for, for heart conditions, for diabetes, all sort, uh, artificial joints and body parts, all sorts of very high tech stuff. Anyway, in their strategic um, evaluation, they, they, they figured out they needed to have more manufacturing in Asia to support their customers in Asia. So where do you think they put their manufacturing in Asia? Maybe a country with the lowest labor cost, lowest real estate cost, maybe somewhere like Vietnam or maybe China? No, they ended up putting the investment in Singapore. Singapore has got some of the highest labor costs and highest real estate costs in, in the region. Why did they choose Singapore? Very simple, Singapore, every year that I can remember, is ranked number one in the world by the World Bank for trade facilitation. And so whatever the cost disadvantages are of having to pay higher wages and more for real estate for this customer would be more than offset by what they save in not having their goods, uh, not having the inputs delayed coming into Singapore and not having the finished product delayed when they export from Singapore to their customers around the region. Okay, now what do we mean when we talk about trade facilitation. That's, that's a shorthand for something, but what, what is it governments really need to do to have world-class trade facilitation? Well, the good news, it's not rocket science, and the even better news, it doesn't cost a lot of money. You know, we heard the Indian uh, uh, Minister of External Affairs yesterday talk about the, India's commitment to, I think, a trillion dollars in infrastructure investment, and that's wonderful. This doesn't take anything close to a trillion dollars. Here's what it takes. First thing, Customs needs to work smarter, not harder. 
okay, they need to use IT solutions to profile the sh and identify the shipments they need to focus their time on and expedite the legitimate flow of trade. So there's a container coming in from, from, let's say, from Apple computer, sealed at the factory, declared to contain iPads. You know what? If Customs really wants to open up every one of those thousand boxes and set, prove to themselves there's nothing in there besides an iPad, they can go ahead, but they're wasting their time. What they need to do is use an IT solution to say that, thousand, that container with a thousand uh, iPads we're going to wave that through. We'll send uh, Apple a bill for the duties and taxes at the end of the month. We're going to target stuff coming from people we never heard of before, stuff that maybe is declared whatever the commodity is. It should weigh maybe five kilos, but it really weighs 50 kilos. That's the one that they should be suspicious of. Now, it may prove to be completely innocent, but those are the shipments where Customs needs to be focusing their attention in order to do their legitimate job even better, in order to, to, to intercept um, uh, contraband to collect legitimate duties and taxes that are owing properly and so on while expediting the legitimate flow of trade. Another thing is what we call de minimis. That's for, for low value shipments up to a certain level to basically wave them through. Not to waste their time processing 21 pieces of paper to collect two dollars worth of duties and taxes. In the US our de minimis level is 200 US dollars. A number of countries are even higher. Australia, it's a thousand Australian dollars, which is roughly equal to a thousand U.S. Singapore, four hundred Singapore dollars, which is over three hundred U.S. So, so now uh, some of you may be thinking, well, if if we just waive these low-value shipments through customs, isn't that going to cut into government revenue? And the answer is not necessarily, because governments will save so much in not having to process the paperwork associated with these low value shipments, they may actually save more on that end than what they uh, give up in the foregone revenue. Uh, and, and just in, in closing, my, my final point I'd like to touch on is what's going on globally to, to try to, uh, to give a framework to improve trade facilitation. Well, one thing that is, I think, encouraging is that the WTO, um, there is a renewed push to have a trade facilitation agreement. The hope is, of course, no one's betting on this, but the hope is it might even be ready for the ministerial in Bali in December this year. And I think an important point on that, a trade facilitation agreement will benefit all the countries that are bound by it for the reasons I've just gone over. So it is not something where certain countries, maybe in the developing world, really need to be paid for that. You know, market access is a different thing that, you know, we can talk about that later. Uh, if, if there's interest, but trade facilitation benefits everyone, and so it's not something where one group of countries needs to get a quid pro quo, needs to get some sort of a payoff for going along with it. Also, the um, regional agreements that have been touched upon by my fellow panelists, the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, will have a, a chapter on supply chains, which will basically have very ambitious commitments on trade facilitation, and equally the new initiative between the US and the European Union the Transatlantic Trade and Inf Investment Partnership is expected to have equally, if not more ambitious, um, commitments on trade facilitation. And so again, picking up on a, a point that's been made, given the amount of trade, of global trade, that will be covered by the Trans-Pacific Partnership and the US-EU agreement, it just seems like there's, as a, as a practical matter, those agreements may set the standard for trade facilitation for, for the globe going forward and other countries that may not be part of those particular agreements that don't want to be left behind. Really, uh, there's no reason for them to be left behind, but they need to take the initiative and step up and improve their trade facilitation practices to equal those that the countries that are in these regional trade agreements are going to see fit to, to, to commit to. So uh, let me stop there, uh, but uh, it's been a pleasure sharing these thoughts with uh, all of you, and I look forward to our further discussion. Thank you. David, and uh, that kind of brings me back to Professor Lehman. Uh, Professor, you said that, uh, you know, you are a little worried about TPP, and David seems to be happy that, you know, it has clauses of trade facilitation. Now, uh, can you just elaborate on your, what are your key concerns if these two uh, big players enter into a TPP? I think it depends very much on, on how you see the world at the moment and how you see the world going. If you see the world at the moment as a place where there's growing sort of understanding and uh, sort of the central people forces are in operation and there's growing trust and all the rest of it, 
then in that case, it's fine. If, on the other hand, you see the world now as where there's a significant amount of mistrust, uh, where there's uh, suspicions, where there are uh, fraught relations, uh, then my sense of TTP, uh, TPP, sorry, and TTIP, uh, apart from being innovations in the alphabet soup, um, is, is that, uh, the, you know, the, the, it, they can be conceived of as, as a means of excluding China, uh, the big guys. Uh, I, I, I worried about some of the, for example, in the, um, a lot of the, the writing of the enthusiasts for the TTIP, uh, for example, The Economist, Financial Times, uh, saying, you know, this way the West is going to be able to impose its rules and all the rest of it. That's not the kind of dialogue that I think we should be hearing now. Uh, I think that there will be a sense of we should be engaging rather than containing. Um, I think, again, that the priority should be the multilateral. One of the things that worries me is on a, on a simply issue of time and energy, that there will be a lot of time and a lot of energy put into these... Uh, particular developments at the expense, I mean, of, of, of the multilateral trading system. So a long time ago, I said, you know, finish Doha, and then you can get on to talking about other things. Uh, but uh, Doha has been uh, postponed. And I think um, I, I would just like to say something. Again, Patricia Hewitt yesterday said that she's an optimist. And I, I guess I am, too. I have seven grandchildren. I need to be an optimist. Um, but I, I think that part of what hindered the Doha development agenda or the Doha round was wishful thinking. Too much optimism. And, and, and I, I think Pascal Lamy is in part responsible for this. So it's OK. It's going OK. It's going to be OK, OK. And, and so th there was, I think, a lack of realism in many respects, sort of looking at that. Uh, there has to be a tremendous amount of confidence building, uh, sort of talking, uh, and um, you know, engaging the, the new players. Could I, just, could I just add one thing uh, on the TPP? And, and let me just say first, um, uh, we're huge supporters of the TPP. And, but, but, but it's not so much by the, the, because of the countries that are involved. It's, it's because of the high standard of the agreement. You know, it's like our, our most ambitious agreement in the US right now is Korea, the Korea-US free trade agreement. And that's sort of a starting point for the TPP. I don't think you'll find any provisions of the TPP that are less liberal than what you have in the US-Korea free trade agreement. But the point I wanted to make is, as, as all of you, I'm sure, know, two countries joined the TPP very recently within the last year, Mexico and Canada. And the way we see it, that totally transformed what this is all about. You know, it's called the TPP because in the beginning it was about the Trans-Pacific. But, but, you know, if you look at the U.S. as the big player on one side of the Pacific, what happened, it, the professor is absolutely right, China is not involved in this, nor is Japan nor is the Republic of Korea, nor is Taiwan. Our big trading partners in Asia are not part of this. Brunei is part of it, and uh, Singapore is part of it, and New Zealand is part of it, and a few other uh, more important trading partners are part of it, but, but the big players of the US across the Pacific are not a part of this at all. Now, they may join someday. Japan has said they, they're interested in joining. I think the architecture is such that it's open to accession by other APEC members and, and possibly in the future even other, other countries. But, but the reason the TPP is so important to us is because it's really become a NAFTA, North American Free Trade Agreement 2.0. OK, it's, it's, it's NAFTA, as ambitious as that was, is a 20-year-old agreement. A lot has changed in the world in the last 20 years. And politically, it would be impossible to, to do another NAFTA. That's just not going to happen. But you, you, you put into the TPP the provisions of the US, Mexico, and Canada want to incorporate into their trading relationship to update it from where it was 20 years ago when NAFTA was negotiated. And then you've got something really big, something important, because of the volume of trade. You know, In FedEx, we're in 220 countries and territories in the world. Our number one market is Canada, and our number two market is Mexico. So, so, so for us, there's nothing more important. than All of the countries are very important, but the most important part of the world for us as an American company is, is North America. And that's really, the, the, to us, the importance of the TPP. Uh, coming back to uh, Dr. Chadrava's point, that he, and that kind of links all of your thoughts together, that whether when we go in for trade agreement, should we do a FTA in goods alone, or how deeper should be the uh, trade agreement, or it should be for, uh, comprehensive, it should in involve uh, services, investments, cooperation, so on and so forth. 
the biggest problem probably countries like thailand or india is going to face in terms of meeting the high regulatory standards of the developed countries because we are still in the process of regulatory uh, evolution where our rules and regulations are changing we also have a lot of uh, restrictions on foreign direct investment if i'm correct in uh, thailand in many sectors there is an fdi restriction up to 49 percent so i would like to ans ask from you you know how are we placed to negotiate such complex trade agreements if we because the trend is towards more complex regulatory issues being part of the trade agreements rather than it is just a tariff liberalization or a market access agreement i think it can be done if even if we have uh, uh, two uh, different size of economies and uh, each economy is so different from the other if we just sit down and say to uh, have a better partnerships economic partnerships between our two countries and uh, using trade and investment as a, an important vehicle but not the exclusive vehicle then if we sit down and list out the top 10 priority things that we want to do with our potential partner and the other partner also uh, do the same thing and then we start from these two documents and then uh, sort out things that need to be negotiated with exceptions uh, to anything this then we can proceed uh, i think along the line of the asean which is started as i said as a uh, custom unions and then evolve gradually uh, with consensus from the member countries uh, uh, into the partnerships and some sort of uh, uh, economic uh, inspiration scheme not perfect but something to start with. And I'm very uh, uh, struck to, uh, I'm very struck to hear that uh, what we know as TPP is uh, NAFTA plus. That's what yeah. it should be called NAFTA zero, two plus zero. No, no, you, <laughs> Professor, Doctor, you, if you call it that, then it will fail. <laughs> but, but, but if you do it and you call it Trans-Pacific Partnership, then, then maybe it has a chance. Okay, okay, good, thank you. indeed uh, Patricia Hewitt and obviously I wanted to come back to Professor Lehman's extremely interesting comments on the WTO and I mean I would certainly agree although for me it's definitely benefit of hindsight that the WTO is now so large and the issue is so complex that there may well never be another single comprehensive trade agreement of the the Uruguay kind um, but two questions one is really on trade facilitation, and, and David Short's extremely interesting comments about that, which I strongly agree with, whether the WTO might be able to achieve a trade facilitation agreement, even if it doesn't include every single WTO member, is there scope for, a, as it were, a coalition of the willing, providing, obviously, that included key players, as many as possible from the South, and not purely those from the developed countries. And my second question, which is a different point, I'd be very interested in the panel's views on the role of the major NGOs in trade negotiations. Because the NGOs were critical to us in Europe several years ago when we really began to get the trade distorting agricultural subsidies reformed because they could make the argument highly effectively. But my sense, certainly in the earlier rounds of the Doha, uh, negotiations was that the NGOs by and large were taking a pretty anti-trade position and that was not helpful from the point of view of getting the kind of leadership that's needed on trade from the South. So comments on those two issues would be wonderful. Would you like to take a 
couple of questions or would you like to respond? You're the boss. Okay, so can we have one more question, one, two more questions, please? We take three questions and then we go for the response. Thank you. Uh, my name is Tim Stratford. I'm with Covington Burley, and I also happen to be a former USTR negotiator. Um, I'm wondering uh, what you think of uh, Robert Zellick's uh, uh, argument in the past about competitive liberalization. And um, I certainly agree with you that if TPP is seen as an effort to contain China, that that's a very non-constructive way to approach it. But if if instead it is seen, and the, and the transatlantic agreement were seen as uh, promoting competitive liberalization, uh, being seen as pilot projects that can in fact demonstrate the benefits of greater liberalization, and then having open architectures that allowed other members, including China, to join, do you think that, that might be a way uh, to, to promote further progress in trade liberalization? Any other questions? To Professor Professor Lehman, I'm J.K. Dadu. I'm Joint Secretary in the Ministry of Commerce. Professor, what I wanted to know from you is how do you negotiate an FTA with countries like Australia and New Zealand, where the populations are very small, but still they have huge trade surpluses with a country like India. Number two, if you look at the trade figures of India since 2001. From $50 billion, the exports uh, last year were $303 billion. And yet for this year, 12, 13, for the first time we've got a dip when all the emerging economies seem to be doing well. What possibly could be the reason for this? What? What possibly, what possibly could be the reason for this dip? In the last 10 years, we have grown at about 20%. And this particular year, there's a dip of nearly 5%. Which does not, uh, which is inexplicable as far as I'm concerned. Easy questions. Um, the WTO uh, is is too big. I, I was actually going to ask you a question <laughs> yesterday, but I guess it's not. Um, appropriate moment, but uh, you know, you, I think one of the points that you made uh, yesterday was the WTO was functioning well in terms of a dispute settlement mechanism, that it really was effective in that respect. And that I, I, I know it's not exactly answering your question, but I simply want to say I agree with. What, what I have, <coughs> the question I, I ask is whether having failed on Doha, and I think it is a failure, whether its legitimacy and credibility can be restored. And the WTO dispute settlement mechanism functions because countries adhere to it. And if you have a sort of erosion of the institution, you know, there could be one day when somebody says, I don't accept uh, the finding of the dispute settlement me mechanism. And that could be the thing that actually brings about the dissolution of WTO. Uh, and that's why I think, among other things, the, the leadership succession is terribly important. Uh, but very important also will be the, the necessity that Washington, Brussels, Tokyo, and so on uh, contribute to uh, strengthening the institution rather than weakening it, which I think they've been doing uh, over the course of the last few years. Um, I think uh, that, and I, I agree with, with everything that my fellow panelists said, and. Um, I think David's point about the uh, trade facilitation and, and also the uh, role of the value chains and all the rest of it is very well taken. This is another example of, of these tremendous changes uh, that are taking place. Um, but um, whether, and, and I think it would be good if Bali could conclude on the trade facilitation agreement. I think that would be positive. Uh, but I, I certainly would not want the champagne to be brought out. I mean, I think you know, it really is very, I mean, I, I think some of the points made by Subachai this morning, agriculture has been abandoned, the development round has been abandoned. Uh, of course, what I very often hear people saying is we never meant when we said development round. Well, you, you said it, uh, and uh, you know, you should live up to it. Uh, so, 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 yes, but I, I again, I, I 
would continue to worry. I think also that, you know, I, when I've said Doha should be declared dead, no, 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 you can't do that. You should never declare international negotiations dead. But this comes, I suppose, to your other point about NGOs, is that we live in an area, mm -hmm. an era, sorry, where trade has, bec has become to a certain extent sort of globalized and to a very considerable extent misunderstood uh, also. But it's, it's, it's um, you know, there's the transparency with the ICT revolution and all the rest of it. Uh, NGOs, I think, very often are, uh, you know, single or dual issue oriented uh, and, and fail to get the, the greater picture. But some, I think uh, Oxfam has played, I think, on, ba on balance a rather constructive role uh, in terms of uh, trade. I think they're more supportive of WTO. We have a fantastic NGO represented, uh, Indian NGO represented here in the person of Pradeep Mehta, who's written a magnificent letter to Obama. Uh, I don't think you've had a reply yet, but uh, anyway, leave your uh, iPhone uh, open to receive messages. So I think that, that, that there are uh, NGOs and NGOs. Um, the, the protest community about the WTO has sort of dissipated, but that's because the WTO has dissipated. It's no longer fashionable because, you know, uh, who cares? The WTO is doing enough harm to itself without needing the help uh, of, uh, of the, uh, the protest uh, community. Um, but I, I think also that this has to be seen in the context. Again, I, there is, there is a, a, a sort of um, hostility against multinational corporations. You know, a lot of the things that the NGOs said was corporate-driven globalization. And, and that's not entirely surprising, given the way that some of them um, uh, behave. Uh, there seems to be a certain degree of irresponsibility. There's a crisis of capitalism in a sense. I mean, it's very difficult to convince people that you know, trade liberalization is the answer to all the problems with the growing inequalities and all the rest of it. That's why I think all of these issues need to be addressed in a sort of uh, holistic fashion. Uh, I don't like competitive liberalization. I mean, I think that uh, what Zolik did there, and I actually was very, very angry, and I wrote him, but he didn't write back. I mean, Obama, well, I'm sure, write to Pradeep, but um, Robert Bob Zolik, although I knew him before he reached those stratospheres, uh, that, you know, it happened immediately after Cancun. And, and, and among other things, I think the timing was terrible. And it's sort of putting the blame, the naysayers. Remember there was that article in the Financial Times, and so we want to bring together the coalition of the willing and competitive liberalization. I think that was the... That was what killed Cancun, well, it killed uh, Doha uh, to a considerable extent. And so it deviated uh, attention uh, away. And, and, and again, as I say, uh, it, there was a cop-out. I mean, again, if you remember, Cancun was about cotton. And, and, and cotton's important in American elections. And, and I, it's, it's very difficult. I'm, I'm not a sort of conspiracy-oriented guy, but there seemed to be some interesting correlation that there was a cotton issue then the collapse of Cancun, and then the uh, competitive uh, liberalization. So I think it's a decoy uh, and not uh, addressing. Um, FTAs with Australia and uh, New Zealand. You see, the thing is, I mean, I, I don't know the answer to your question. Uh, I've never, but I think the point here, though, is, you know, as was said this morning, there are 300 odd uh, FTAs in, in, in operation, another 500 or not. Another 200, sorry, that have been. Uh, is, do we really need all these things? I mean, if you had a properly functioning multilateral trading system, you wouldn't need to worry about doing a, an FTA with uh, Australia and, and, and New Zealand. Uh, and, and that, I, I think, is when the history of uh, trade in the first decade of the 21st century, first decade and a half, comes to be written. I, I think what we'll see is a tremendous dissipation uh, of energy and, and failing to address what are the critical problems. Why would India, when it's got, you know, as the foreign minister reminded us and others, so many things that it needs to address right now, try to get the growth back up, etc., be wasting energy on, 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 on for, forging an FTA with Australia and New Zealand? I think there's also something in that, the, the FTAs, is that, it, you know, you, you've got to be doing an FTA because otherwise you're not in it. Uh, yeah, it, it's it's the thing that, that that everybody's doing. I didn't understand. I'm sorry, I didn't hear. It's not. I didn't understand your last question about the dip in what? So it's my hearing. The last ten years, exports have grown at about twenty percent. 
Okay, yeah. Okay, thank you. This is a dip yeah. about 5%. Yeah. Yeah. Which I, uh, I'm not able to fathom why, because all the emerging economies uh, have done well. So I just wanted to uh, pick your brains on why it could have been. Yeah, I, and my brain's not very fertile on that issue, but I, I mean, I just, I, and others in the panel may be able to, but I think two things. I mean, one is, is Europe, clearly. So the, the shipment to, I mean, if, if south, south trade may be buoyant, but uh, trade to, to, to Europe is declining. The other thing, which we, again, I, I suppose we should talk about, is trade finance, which has been, uh, we, we, which is simply not what it should be in terms of. So I think it's extremely, very difficult, particularly for small and medium-sized enterprises, uh, to find, you know, the kinds of support that they would need. Uh, to continue there. Uh, so so that, that's hypotheses. Uh, may I actually help to reply to his questions? Oh, good. Um, the, uh, basically, if you look into India, you know, in India there are two major issues. One is manufacturing has not grown. Facilitation for manufacturing has not really happened. Uh, basically, if you look into sectors which would help manufacture to grow, there are restrictions. One of the biggest restrictions is trade facilitation issues. Cost of real estate is rising, land ownership is a problem. So if you are not able to manufacture, if you are not able to be a part of the global value chain, whether you do an FTA or you don't do an FTA, whether you participate in trade, you don't participate in trade, you are losing your share in the global trade. If you talk to Indian industry under the foreign trade policies, yet none of the industry can use it. And if you add that to all the schemes and incentives given by the Indian government, today there are over 100 schemes and incentives given to the manufacturing sector, yet Indian industry is going abroad and doing their FDI elsewhere. So that is what you really need to look into. You need to have a consolidated policy and scheme for the industry to operate, give them the basic infrastructure. Not, it is not a about investing so many trillions in uh, infrastructure. It is about making the infrastructure smooth, basically moving from infrastructure to carriage issues. Probably a seamless transport and a better interstate movement would lead to more external trade for India rather than investing three trillions. We have a question. Any, any, let me see if any of the panelists wants to respond and then I'll get back to you. Uh, yeah, I'd like to just offer a comment on this of uh, competitive liberalization. And uh, what I would have to say about that is I, I think it's inevitable and it's already happening. And the one example I'd give is China. You know, the U.S. does not have a free trade agreement with China, and yet it's our second largest trading partner. And I think there are a lot of other countries in the world that don't have free trade agreements with China, but it's, it's still a huge trading partner. And, and, and you drill down a little bit more uh, at, at the, the area I was focused on today, trade facilitation. Well, China still has a way to go. If you look at the World Bank... Uh, doing business report, China is almost in the top third of countries of the world. So it's, it's still got about 60-some countries to pass if it wants to be number one, but there are about 120 countries that are worse than China is at trade facilitation. And on the, the dollar cost of importing a container into China and exporting a container from China, they're in the top 10 countries in the world. And, and I think the simple answer, the Chinese leadership gets it. They want their economy to do well. They want their economy to grow. And so they, 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 they have adopted certain measures to uh, improve their trade facilitation and to make it easier for their businesses uh, to import and export. So I think, I think that's an example. We're already seeing it without the need for, for, a, trade, uh, for, for a free trade agreement. Yes, I want to uh, touch on the question of the uh, role of the uh, civil societies or NGOs on, on the FTA. I was recently appointed uh, to be the chief negotiator for Thai EU FTA, and the uh, first person that called me was not the EU ambassador to Bangkok, but was the uh, head of the civil society. And uh, I received a uh, very nicely, uh, nicely written uh, uh, question to me, uh, to be forwarded uh, to the Prime Minister. And, uh, I had to come down and then accept the, uh, the letter uh, publicly to make sure that uh, I have done my job. And then I talked with them, and I 
think that the role of the civil society in the FTA, particularly if the uh, FTA of the country is involved uh, value chains. In our case, it's the um, our food, Thailand is the food exporter, uh, one of the major food exporters in the world. And the structure of the food exporter is that done mostly by multinationals at the tail end of it, exports. But if you go back to the value chain, it would go all the way down to the farming level. So the upstream origins of the food exportables in Thailand are at the farm level. And here, civil society are really uh, interested in making sure that the returns to the farmers are fair and adequate. And also, the whole production process would not be using something that detrimental to the environment and the, uh, the uh, health of the people involved. So, um, in our case, in the case of Thailand, uh, we decided to incorporate the uh, members of the civil society in our, uh, in our uh, planning and uh, stage, and also we keep members of our civil societies, particularly those who are concerned with the disadvantaged uh, group of population, like uh, uh, people who are chronically ill and need uh, some medical treatment like AIDS and so on and so forth. So we have to uh, be very uh, mindful of the uh, concern and we have to take their concern into consideration in our negotiation. And then I went to Brussels, uh, we found out the same thing, that uh, EU commissioner also would have to talk to their own uh, civil society people and we try to get all the interests taken care of. Not just elimination of the trade barriers, but also to make sure that the, uh, the free trade is fair to all uh, stakeholders in the whole value chain. Uh, can we have the mic here, please? Yeah, I, <coughs> thank you. I'm uh, Pradeep Mehta. I'm head of uh, Cuts International. Uh, we started in India, and we still continue to work in India, but we also work out of Geneva. Hanoi, Lusaka, and Nairobi. I just wanted to mention this, uh, uh, that yes, I mean, we are a southern voice. Uh, and as Patricia Hewitt is gone, just wanted to uh, share with her that not all NGOs are anti-trade. I mean, we are certainly pro-free trade, but it should be fair trade with balanced rules. And that is the reason why we have been active. Number one. Number two, as against the Uruguay round, uh, if you see the evolution of civil society and knowledge uh, during the Doha round, it has been exponential. So you must understand that the scene has changed completely at the time of Uruguay round. I remember Mr. Dadu going into the Commerce Ministry, and the then Joint Secretary looked at us uh, uh, wondering as to what is this animal doing here? Because you were only used to dealing with chambers of commerce and never NGOs as such. Though, of course, that recognition came about uh, subsequently that we served as advisor in the commerce ministry for long. That process is now over uh, for its own fault. The problem, as was mentioned by the <coughs> Dr. Chai Pravat, is the issue about civil society consultation and that can help, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> uh, make processes much more easier. Let me give you an example from India. It's EU-India FTA, which has been negotiated for long. And civil society is rightly concerned. Because what we are worried about is that there might be trips plus commitments being made uh, in that particular agreement, which means <clears throat> that a lot of good things which India has done as a leader of the developing world in terms of how to deal with trips and public health and public order issues would probably be uh, shrunk. And that is not what we would like to see happen, and neither would you as uh, Thai government would like to see it happening. 
and therefore these and therefore one of the reasons that the EU India FTA has been prolonging, you know, this has not been able to come to a conclusion because of also very hard sort of red lines drawn by both sides of the negotiation. But that is an issue which is besides well, the other issue I wanted to touch about was the issue about Cancun. Cancun, in my opinion, was not a failure. Uh, it was a collapse. Uh, and it was a turning point in the trading history. Uh, the old quad was dissolved and a new quad came into being, which included US, EU, India, Brazil, and China, which uh, joined up uh, particularly later. That shift in geopolitics or geoeconomics itself has been a major reason, one of the major reasons as to why the Doha round is not been moving. The second issue which has been raised by Montek and reiterated by Jopier here was the issue about the development uh, component of the Doha round, which basically meant dealing with the dirty agriculture subsidies, and that unfortunately has not happened. Incidentally, what has been very scandalous, if you look at the latest EU budget uh, that maintains the agriculture subsidies at the same level as it was, when <coughs> they actually wanted it to be brought down uh, as was forecasted. And what is more surprising is, on the one hand, when the whole EU is under an economic suicide, you continue to deal with these, uh, these issues, surely out of political expediency. So unless some of these issues are dealt with, uh, I, I'm watching that you're watching your watch. Yeah, I have already been given an instruction that we need to stop immediately. Right. So uh, can we just... Okay, let me, uh, let me conclude here. Now, of course, the subject of the session was on trade barriers. Trade barriers will continue to be there as uh, for several reasons, political reasons, social reasons, and environmental reasons. Uh, but how do you deal with them will have to be seen. I don't think that a U.S.-EU transatlantic agreement can ever achieve any kind of consensus on the regulatory barriers which is you know, affecting their own trade. But anyway, that may happen for the next 25 years, the agreement. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I, uh, thank you very much. And uh, I would like to thank my co-panelists for the uh, discussions and to all the participants and for your comments and discussion. Thank you very much.